Okay. Um, I just want to greet all of you again this evening for coming to our virtual tour of the city of Bethlehem. Um, those of you that joined us last time are familiar with Father Ilya. Um, some of you, I'm sure, are new uh, this evening, and uh, I'll, I'll introduce him briefly to you again this evening. Um, I think I said the last time that it seems like Father Ilya and I have been friends forever, um, yet, uh, yet I think it's only about two years or three years or so that we've actually um, spent time together personally. Um, Father Ilya is the pastor of Holy Door Mission Church in Binghamton, New York. Uh, uh, with his uh, wife and his children. He serves there. Um, he's also um, the chairperson uh, and the heart and the soul of Orthodox Tours, uh, which unfortunately uh, during these days of COVID has um, not been the functioning uh, um, stalwart of Orthodox tourism that, that it was before COVID. We're hoping that once the virus finds its way through and past the world, Father Ilya will be again able to take us uh, in tour on person, in person. Um, if you've been on tour with Father Ilya, you know what a, a joyful experience and an educational experience that is, and uh, I'm, I'm sure he'll provide you with some of that this evening. Just some housekeeping before we begin. Um, I have muted all of you, and uh, Father Ilya, I believe, now is unmuted. Once we begin the presentation, I'm going to disable the ability to mute or unmute um, for, for, for you um, for, for several reasons. One, if you go up to the top right of your screen, um, you'll see a box up there that says view. Um, for the best experience in the tour, you want to change that to speaker view so that when Father Ely is speaking and sharing his screen, um, he's the main uh, focus of, of the tour. Um, if I unmute you and uh, and others talk uh, like like that, like that, um, it changes this the the view of the screen and it takes away um, from the presentation. So you won't be able to unmute as we go through the presentation. If you have questions, uh, direct chat those questions to me in the chat at the bottom. And um, uh, we'll get those answered at the end when there's times for questions and answers you can you can ask Father Ilya. Um, the, the, the final note, uh, what is it? I should have written it down. Um, I guess uh, the, the, the final note is um, for Father Ilya to give this presentation, it probably would be good for him to see you. So if you don't mind turning on your video, then he may have a gallery view and be able to to be able to at least see the people that he's speaking to, and that will work uh, for him. Um, uh, but otherwise, like I said, speaker view for you, so whoever's talking will be able to talk. You won't be able to unmute questions to chat. Um, so thank you all for coming this evening. I think uh, we had about 42 household, households registered, and through your help, we've raised... Um, I think 12 or $1,300 for the FOCA United Fund through your generosity. We appreciate that and helping the charitable works of the FOCA. So without taking up more of your time, um, I'm going to turn things over um, to Father Elia. Uh, welcome, Father Elia, and uh, I'll be glad to spend an evening with you in Bethlehem tonight. Thank you, Father Nicholas, and thank you everyone for your attendance here tonight and for your generous donation to FOCA. That of course is greatly appreciated. First of all, I wanted to ask if you could hear me well. We, I, we, I can hear you fine, Perfect. Father Julian. So. Perfect. Perfect, yes. Usually, um, you know, we're turning the mic on as not to have inadvertent uh, interruptions of the presentation, but maybe at the end, if you would like to uh, voice any of your questions that be possible or send them in chat, I'm able actually to see your questions as well during the presentation or take notes. Um, uh, I prepared uh, a Google slide presentation with some of the pictures. Some of them are very much high definition, others not so much, so please bear with me, but I'll try to do the presentation it's as high definition as possible. And of course, I'm looking to interact after our uh, presentation with you and to answer any and all of your questions. Um, 
uh, presentation, I, I'm not going to time myself, but it's going to be, uh, I think, about an hour, give or take, maybe a bit more. So um, I hope that you're going to enjoy it. Um, uh, when Father Nicholas asked me to talk about uh, pilgrimage to Bethlehem, I started to think as to how to format the presentation. It was not easy task because information is absolutely incredible. Just to show pictures is not going to do justice to anyone. You may find those same very pictures, albeit in different order on the internet. And I didn't want that. I want to make it a little bit comprehensive. At the same time, I get spooked a little bit today after posting an article in one of the internet groups, uh, a message from the moderator was reprimand came such academic posts are not going to attract any likes, it was said. So I'm not suggesting to take you down, but please take a note to make it a little bit simpler. So I'll try not to make it overly complicated, but perhaps something that you're going to hear tonight is going to be slightly different from an image that you may have from an average nativity card that you're about to receive from someone, what you're going to send, to send out. But I'm thinking that's the beauty of it. If you're going to be a little bit intellectually stimulated, and uh, I don't don't want to say challenged, please by all means uh, uh, learn, because I don't want I'm not here to dissuade the nativity story. I'm here to give you as much as possible information, so the uh, uh, rest of the advent uh, for you is going to be as blessed as possible, and the celebration of nativity is going to be as much as joyful. Uh, as possible and filled with thanksgiving for the incarnation of our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let me start sharing the screen and we'll, we'll um, begin with our presentation. Okay, I hope you could hear me well. Those of you who have camera on, can you please wave if you could see the, if you could see the image on your screen? Okay, perfect. Perfect. And we'll start with slideshow. So there's going to be a picture of the entire screen. Okay. So here we see an image of nativity from the Menologian of Basil II, um, one of the most complete uh, manuscripts uh, supplemented by um, pictures of the feast days. And of course, here we see traditional rendition of the nativity. And it's an honor of that feast that we're meeting tonight and discussing things. It's a multi-layered picture. So we, uh, we see the birth of infant Jesus, although Mary is not reclining as usually the icons, but we see midwife washing him off. We see already Christ placed in the manger with a donkey and uh, a cow looking at him. We see angel, uh, giving a message to the shepherds. We see wandering Joseph who thinks about how it's going to be. And we see these two angels on top who represent the uh, multitude of the angelic hosts who singing praise to God. So where did this play, uh, where did this event take place and what are we going to talk to you about? First of all, a couple words about the city of Bethlehem. Many of you may think of it as a small village Definitely during the earthly life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it was not even a township. It was a village, albeit it was mentioned in the um, historical sources, um, uh, most notably in the Stella, known as Stella of Amarna. It's a, a correspondence between the uh, 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 Egyptian court uh, and the uh, Egyptian supervisors of these. Canaanite territories, the uh, village of Bethlehem is mentioned as inhabited by Canaanites. Um, in the holy tradition of Jews and Christians, uh, Bethlehem is the birthplace of our, uh, not only the birthplace of our savior, but also the birthplace of uh, King David. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it. Um, uh, Rehoboam, the grandson uh, of King David, fortified uh, the city whether it was dynastic uh, uh, connection or whether it was due to the fact that uh, kingdom, unified kingdom uh, was sp uh, spread into Israel and Judea and he needed more fortified towns remain unknown. Actually, the territory is not very archeological, ar ar not very well archeologically attested from the time period. 
then we know that uh, uh, Bethlehem, uh, whatever structures were, were destroyed by Emperor Hadrian. So we have a gap of good 1100 years in between. And it started to gain its provenance dramatically uh, since the pilgrimage of Empress Helena in early fourth century uh, AD when she built the uh, Basilica, the Church of Nativity over the grotto where Savior was born. And it became a very major uh, a pilgrim destination. But, but today's Bethlehem is a funny place. As you could see, it has knockoffs of various coffee shops and things of that nature. It's a very lively city. Up until uh, mid 20th century, the city was uh, largely Christian. Now um, the dynamics shifted. Um, not more than 10% of the population of city is still Christian, perhaps even less but it's the uh, social dynamics that we're not going to cover in our today's presentation. Um, but it has all the modern features, hotels, uh, it's tourism based, immediate uh, core city has 25,000 and metropolitan area, if we can talk about Bethlehem as metropolitan area, which essentially it's a suburb of Jerusalem in today's terms, has a population of about 100,000 people. Although it's located in the Palestinian territories, um, uh, behind the huge security barrier. And uh, of course, Palestine is not recognized uh, internationally, universally state, but theoretically it's two different administrations. Um, uh, the greatest attraction of course is the Church of Nativity and the greatest celebration uh, uh, around the uh, Nativity of our Lord. And so as the church draws uh, up and Till the COVID era, up to several million people every year. Um, but there is a regular life there. So whenever we thinking about Bethlehem as something very mysterious, uh, shrouded in this holy tale, it has very modern dimension. And many people are actually surprised when they come there and they see those rocky houses and modern populace and people dressed in national outfits, uh, sometimes pretending to be some of a historical origin, sometimes just following the um, uh, desert Arabic tradition. Of course, uh, Arab nomads came there uh, much later in history, but nevertheless, there is an illusion on uh, historical uh, continuity of sorts. And of course, it's very hard to discern what's uh, truly historical and what may be uh, a bit embellished by the imagination of the today's residents of Bethlehem. So for us, it's very important to uh, remember that uh, universal acceptance of Christ as the Messiah has deep roots and the Jewish belief of coming of the deliverer and restoration of kingdom. Um, maybe in a historical perspective, historical kingdom, but we know that Christ said that his kingdom is not of this world. The embodiment of that universal kingdom and the blessing of the Lord uh, found at climax in a historical figure of King David, about whom outside the Bible we know actually very little. But we're not going to dive deep into historical biblical criticism. We're going to try to stick out to the traditional narrative. And of course, story of King David as if as it is related to Bethlehem starts with uh, the story of Naomi and Ruth. Um, a book of Ruth is very short. It's just four chapters, and I highly recommend to you to read it as it is a, a marvelous uh, little story. It's a story of humility and a story of devotion to God. Those of you who don't remember the story, I allow myself to remind it very briefly. Um, you know, citizens of Bethlehem, uh, Naomi and her husband in time of uh, drought, in time of famine, moved to the land of Moab, which is the uh, on the other side of the Dead Sea from Bethlehem, so basically east of uh, Bethlehem. Um, but Naomi's husband unfortunately dies, and so two of their sons, who by then are young men, but al and already married, but still young people, and she parts with her daughters in law, saying that there is nobody whom could provide for them and she advised them to go back to their mother's houses and Ruth uh, who is a Moabite 
and uh, shows an incredible devotion to her mother-in-law and says that she's going to stay with her regardless, as it is depicted in the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 16. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. And I'm thinking it's a very striking example as to why Ruth is chosen by God, albeit a foreigner, not a Jew, um, to become the mother of King David and ultimately the Savior. As they move back to Bethlehem, where she meets Boaz on the advice of her mother-in-law, Naomi, they get married. She expresses herself very humbly and attracts attention of Boaz. And uh, they conceive a child upon that marriage. And uh, uh, ultimately, the father of Jesse Byrne, uh, 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 born out of that marriage, is, would become uh, uh, first Odin, then uh, Jesse, and then uh, David is born of Jesse. And out of root of the Jesse, salvation of mankind springs. Uh, the imagery of David as the king is very important because it certainly has messianic connotation. Whether it was interpreted like that historically or not is outside of scope of this discussion, but we see how uh, people uh, or the aspirations of the people by time of incarnation of our Lord were looking at it and how the Christian interpreters look at, at King David. Um, uh, a man um, of uh, simple origin, or maybe a relatively well endowed family, not a simpleton, but nevertheless, he was the uh, shepherd on the field, um, you know, working for, for you know, tending to his father's or his family, family flocks, who grows to prominent by answering the call of King Saul. Uh, during the war uh, with uh, Philistine, Philistines and by killing the Goliath, a giant warrior soldier, uh, who inherits in marriage the daughter of King Saul and who King Saul, after many adventures, appoint to be his successor. Um, that ascend into the ultimate kingship of where he would become the ultimate leader, maybe creator of some legendary, but nevertheless, state of Israel at the height of its glory, not the builder of the temple yet, but actually embodiment of an ultimate king and a deliverer. And that's how Christians would look at David, because in Christ, there would be ultimate fulfillment of David's role of what David have foreshadowed. And I selected the similar imagery exactly to draw the parallel of how King David was looked at uh, by early Christian writers and how we look at him even until the present day. The good shepherd, the one who takes care of his uh, sheep, even to the point of death, death on the cross, and point of the, and point of the uh, resurrection. Another aspect of uh, King David's ministry, of course, is his kinship. And we see in the same very fashion Christ, who is being the ultimate king. So whenever a, a religious person of the first century AD looked back on the um, uh, glorious time of King David, when he saw the ministry of the king as the one who provides for his people, who takes care of his people, who is a good shepherd, and at the same time is not stripped of his um, uh, royal status, and in fact exalts the state, and who are the state if not the people, embodiment of that all fulfillment of the messianic uh, promise is truly fulfilled in Christ, who is the kingdom, uh, who is the king of heaven and earth, and at the same time is the one who takes care of every, even the very lost uh, ship from his flock. Um, for Matthew and for Luke, and in Matthew, in Gospels in Matthew and Luke, we um, have the description, albeit very shortly in both uh, Gospels, but only two out of four the narratives of birthplace. It was ultimately necessary to place the Holy Family in Bethlehem. Luke talks about the census, and we're going to talk about the census in a minute, for which 
Joseph, who was originally from Bethlehem, the betrothed husband of Mary, had to return. Matthew just talked that they are already in Bethlehem. And here we have to understand that perhaps historical debate as to where they were in Bethlehem, although actually living in Galilee in one of the senses, is actually outside the scope of the debate. Um, if they were not in Bethlehem, and if there was no Bethlehem, it had to be invented and placed in a very particular setting. Ancient literature is not historical literature in a sense as we understand it. It does not necessarily give us a very precise account of the historical events. And albeit Luke is very particular with very details and relate to us many of the details, uh, perhaps even with greater precision uh, than some of his uh, writing contemporaries. Nevertheless, the whole focus was on a very different thing. The focus was on the relation of a messianic idea. We people who live in a broader sense West, especially you know, technologically orientated and very much polished by Protestant attitudes to things, uh, fight for biblical truth as if every word has to correspond to the truth how we understand it. But the issue is with the message that is related to us by various formulas, if you wish, by various allusions, by various hints, by something that people already do understand and anticipate. Christ could not be born but in Bethlehem. That's the message. But you need to build a very particular historical canvas for it, and hence the historical elements. And we may never know whether the story unfolded exactly as it was described, or it may have been, but it's not what is of particular importance in that story. The story is that the Messiah indeed is born from the lineage of David, and David's place is Bethlehem. Not Jerusalem, the glorious mighty capital of this mighty kingdom, but the humble village that was humble in the time of David, not more than a hamlet, and certainly was very humble during the earthly life of our Savior. So the gospel relates to us, and here you see beautiful Byzantine mosaic describing the census, and census as did happen in the Roman Empire. We have some um, uh, actual uh, carvings, actual um, statuary that depicts uh, the census being taken throughout the Roman Empire that was taken for the tax purposes, of course. We hear about the census of Quirinius. And if we'll be very particular about it, yes, we have to admit that there are some historical inconsistencies in the gospel account. But again, as I already explained, it should not throw us off because these are events that indeed have taken place and we're not to reconcile them, but to take as that author relating a salvific message to us all reminds us that it's not a legend as there were many, not a false statement, but indeed a history whose Particulars may not be necessarily known to us, but nevertheless shrouded in a very real historical setting. In the sixth century, as, as to our calculation, uh, AD Anna Domini, after the incarnation of the Lord according to the flesh, uh, Romans dismiss Herod Archelaus, the son of Herod the Great, and they convert his territory and the Roman province of Judea and to the Roman, formal Roman dominion. If before it was a puppet kingdom, now it becomes just a Roman province. And he needs to carry a census for tax purposes. He's governor of Syria, you know, the, the, the broader scope with the uh, chief province being in uh, Antioch and or Damascus, right? So puppet kingdom cl clients of the, those cl Roman clients, they were never taxed in this in the in that sense. They were allies, but population have not been counted for tax purposes. No, they no the population had to move from one place to the other. So um, that census that indeed have had have, have taken place um, uh, comes into a bit of a conflict again, as I said, because the gospel narrative plays the birth of our savior during the time of Herod the Great. So Herod the Great and Herod Archelaus' father and son, and census was actually 
conducted upon the death of the son. Um, do we need to reconcile it really or not? No, we don't. We're talking about here an imperial lineage and historical figures talk about the general historical period as to when it have taken place. Thus, we're coming to Bethlehem. And this is the pictures of Bethlehem. As I said, a small village even at the beginning of the 20th century. These are the oldest photographs, perhaps at the end of 19, early 20th century, uh, as to how people lived there during the Ottoman times. It was, of course, before World War I and for a good several hundred years, the territory was part of the Ottoman Empire. And majority Christians and Muslims lived side by side in this very interesting household that very closely actually resembled as to what may have been during the earthly life of our Savior. So uh, jo Joseph, the betrothed, and pregnant Mary, they do come to the town of Bethlehem, and there is no place for them at the inn. Um, Were there inns in Bethlehem at that time? Uh, uh, Luke explains there were a multitude of people in light of senses, of course, so they could not find themselves a place. No. Actual uh, translation in the gospel and the word that is used is kataluma, uh, and kataluma means upper room. That same word will be used uh, in the gospel to describe the room of the Last Supper where Jesus would be gathered with his disciples for last or mystical supper. Most of the houses were located on two or even three layers. Depends on the size of the family and sometimes various uh, additions were made. So you could see the uh, a scheme or plan of uh, such uh, houses from the first century AD. And here's a reconstruction of a house. So the this kataluma would be the upper place where uh, guest room living quarters of the family would be located. And in the light of the multitude of the people, for whatever other reasons, there was no space there. And Joseph and Mary were put in the lower level, actually, where there was kitchen and where during the inclement weather, animals uh, have been uh, placed to put them away from the storms and rain and, 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 and such. So it was uh, a dwelling in which animals and humans at time lived literally side by side. Another very important thing to remember, of course, is that uh, when Mary is giving birth, she needs to go through ritual cleansing. Uh, any issue of blood, either related to uh, childbirth or either it's a wound, um, it would consider uh, or would make a person unclean, unable to offer the right sacrifice, unable to offer the right prayers, and called for a necessity of an offering at the temple. So. At that point, anybody who bleeds, male or female, regardless of their circumstances, if there is issue of blood, they consider to be unclean and need to stay out of the uh, general population as not to defile the rest. It's not to say that it was not a big deal, but just imagination of a barn that is located somewhere in the field, perhaps uh, a bit incorrect. Uh, but nevertheless, we're still talking about, again, what is the message? The message is an ultimate humbleness that God, is in trust, God entrusts himself, the son of God entrusted into the hand of man uh, with absolute confidence, and yet he don't mind, so to say, uh, to be born into the very, very, very humble circumstance. Truly, when we uh, hear that he assumed the um, image of a slave, uh, it's not... Uh, parable it's not truly an exaggeration um totally from a different universe totally from a different place recently in the city of pompeii an italian uh, ancient city that was buried by the ashes of vesuvius as they excavated uh, the room where slaves were and that very room it was a storage place it was a kitchen was placed for animals so even if the societal arrangement in uh, Palestine at the time among the Jews may have been slightly different from Roman, really the idea of being born right next to the animal is, in a sense, uh, if not a hint, but the sign of semi-slavery, semi 
semi humbleness, not semi humbleness, but very real humbleness, actually, and and the 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 the, the, the humblest the humbles the humble the humblest proposition the humblest proposition possible, um, and when Christ is born, there is a message to the shepherds who are in the field. Over here, we see a beautiful uh, miniature from an uh, old English Bible. Of course, we have no any uh, photo documentation of angels appearing to, to the shepherds, but nevertheless, it's a beautiful ancient manuscript. And uh, what is very interesting um, is that uh, in the Christian tradition, the place where apparition of the angels had happened, and where the good news were pronounced to the shepherds, uh, there is a monastery, a monastery until the present day, and it was there from the very early point on, from the fourth century AD. And here you could see the plan of the excavated site. On your left-hand side, as you see, there is a plan of a grotto or of a cave um, with the underground church. And on top, you could see the layout of the basilica, and it's from historical Byzantine period um, that, uh, later would be destroyed a new monastery would be would be built adjacent to that place so here you could see the remains of the monastery in the upper left corner and then the views of the cave as it is looks today um, but of course it's built uh, within the same byzantine uh, underground compound it's believed that the shepherds were there and that uh, even the bones of the shepherds over here in the lower picture you could see an opening and there are some uh, bones and skulls that are believed to be those the bones of the shepherds most likely those are the bones of um, uh, monks that were uh, executed there during the persian invasion of 614 but nevertheless this is a place where the holy apparition of angels to the shepherds is commemorated that's the uh, new monastery at the site and there is again a very interesting element we have a bit of a disconnect i'll dare say the monasteries were males or females, men or women who are called for that ministry, go to pray to God and to a complete devotion. And when people go to the Holy Land, they say, we don't want to go to any monasteries, show us the holy sites. And that's where this disconnect demonstrates most vividly, because people who believed that the very land was sanctified by the incarnation of God, by... Uh, movement, so to say, by travel of his adopted father or his most precious mother, of his students, of his relatives, of many biblical personalities, that land is truly holy and those places were sanctified by the actual historical event that have taken place. Even as I mentioned, we may not necessarily know every particular detail, but it's not of essence. The fact is that it happened here. At times when place was not known, it was appointed to commemorate very historicity of that incarnation, that Christianity became very much a tangible religion because invisible God, who have not been seen from the creation of the world natural no, no before that, became known and was revealed in the form of our Lord Jesus. So it was of utmost importance to guard that place, to worship at it as the place of immediate of immediacy of God's presence. And those monasteries were built there that men or, or women, majority were men actually at that time, could guard that place and provide for the pilgrims to tell them tales, reinforce their faith, uh, provide for their needs. So those holy places were marked by those monastic dwellings because supposedly they were not taking anything for profit or for themselves and they were taking care of the needs of the pilgrims ushering them through that holiness and allowing pilgrims to become a part of that incredible story so whenever in excavations a monastery or church is not found probably it was not the place in 19th centuries there was a whole trend among uh, Protestant travelers not to go to Catholic and Orthodox sites and uh, to try to invent the holy sites, which dynamic may be that resembling of the fourth century, but again, it lacked complete historical tradition, historical attachment to the oral tradition in those places. But many sites that are venerated by Catholics and Orthodox today is they have those historical remains and the Byzantine 
uh, walls, Byzantine mosaics, uh, shards of pottery, uh, pieces of the holy altars, uh, relics of the martyrs are the closest that we could come to this biblical history that actually lasts into the church history. We are not seeing ourselves as being separated by this divine re revelation that was the consummation, the consummation of which was or is in the Holy Scripture, but Holy Scripture is inseparable from the Holy Tradition. And we as a church understand ourselves as a continuation of that tradition. We are not separated from it. It's not one tradition versus the other, one flow that goes from one sort of say described in word perspective of relation God and man into our very into our very life. It sort of say spills out and we coming to be the partakers of that very grace. And I would like to say just a couple of words about the apparition to the angels, as it was uh, truly a miraculous event. The way it is described is described as if about the divine presence, you know, it's sudden appearance of light. Um, first an angel and then a multitude of hosts. In the Old Testament, the apparition of God to holy individuals or apparition of angels were interchangeable things. You know, most notably uh, Jacob uh, fighting with the angel of the Lord. So whenever angel appears, it, he's divine messenger, but it could be the embodiment of God's will, of God's word itself. Um, singing angels, an allusion to Psalm 148, verse 1, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from heavens, praise him in the heights, multitude of angels singing that. Uh, the message that they give to the shepherds uh, that is commonly translated, and we hear in Christmas carols, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, the most precise translation is on earth peace to men of goodwill. We reminded that we are called to make this particular choice within the days of our life. The message is broad and all encompassing, but at the same time, but at the same time, it requires something from us. It requires our traveling, it requires our participation, it requires our approach of holy. You need to have that goodwill within yourself or good intent within yourself, better say, in order to have the pleasing uh, will of the Lord upon you. A very interesting thing that angels appear to the shepherds. Um, of course, those nuances are lost to us, but culturally speaking, in the first century AD, as we may assume from the later uh, Talmudic writings, shepherds were not allowed even to witness, witness at the court. They were considered to be the lowliest of lowly. Even being Jews, they could not witness uh, or, or, or testimony uh, in, in, in the court. Uh, the, another Jewish treatise suggests that no hope must be given to heathens or to shepherds, um, as if they are probably uh, simple people who are not only largely illiterate, but also poor, and for that there is no God's grace in them. What else could we see? But again, perhaps countering that, the words of the Virgin Mary in her Magnificat is inserted. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. So again, we see uh, the construct as to how the uh, narration, the, 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 the narrative, the context of the story of the birth of our Savior is built, even by using the example of these humble servants of the Lord, the shepherds lifted up, it is to them that the grace of God is truly revealed. Also, according to the Mishnah Talmud, it says that the uh, sacrificial sheep intended for the daily sacrifice in the temple were fed in the Bethlehem pastures. Uh, we could entertain many ideas and all of them would be actually correct as to why this message is compactly fitted uh, into, into that narrative. Um, shepherds who represent the poorest of the uh, Gentiles, wise men from the East that represent all nations, East of Bethlehem, there are three known countries, Persia, Arabia, and India. And wise men are just men of discernment, astrologers or astronomers, 
uh, it's not going to be until centuries later when they're going to be interpreted as kings or or uh, uh, you know some kind of magi or something of that nature. Just the best of the Gentile world and everything from the Jewish world uh, that encompass not only men of noble birth but even the simplest to everyone that the message is given. God calls to him to himself absolutely everyone. Of course, an allusion at David taking care of the flocks on the field. You know, there's this Davidic connection, not only by the place of birth, but what David was actually doing and a sacrifice in the temple because we believe that Christ in himself is an actual lamb who truly bears the sin of the world and in him there is ultimate redemption. I see this beautiful uh, picture by D Domenico Theocopoulos um uh, al greco as the adoration of the adoration of the magi um uh, adoration excuse me uh, the adoration of the shepherds of the adoration of the shepherds um so the magi who coming from the east very prominent theme uh, in christian art from the very early point on uh, to a representation from sarcophagi uh, to my right the one of the earliest surviving Christian uh, articles um, that represent the scene, but overall it goes back all the way and it's not by mistake because of course we are uh, attached or plugged in to the Jewish nation. So it was very important for Gentiles to be reaffirm, reaffirmed that as if the wise men are coming to adore Christ, that blessing through their adoration spreads to the rest of those who come and adore Christ the King. Now, just before we'll start talking about the main attraction, Bethlehem Basilica of Nativity, we need to say that according to very early Christian tradition, the birth of Christ was in the grotto or in the cave and you may say well you didn't show us the cave you showed us the house was two levels but at times the lower level was in the cave uh, terrain in uh, in all of palestine and all of modern day israel is very rocky and very very hilly and many of the houses built on slopes and architecture didn't change much through centuries and over here we see to the left a very tragic uh, actually picture it's an abandoned palestinian village on the outskirts of jerusalem um, um, during the nagba period or maybe a little bit later a palestinian population was uh, has have fled the area and uh, this village was never populated but it gives a very actually interesting attraction never mind the overgrowth of the village as to how many of the jewish villages have looked like uh, during the period of earthly life of our savior and they build into the side of the hill and of course you could use a uh, lower level as a storage place because it doesn't get quite as hot um, uh, you could uh, bring your animals in when the weather outside is bad so you utilize the facility there is not much uh, trees but there is plenty of rock and if there are natural cavities uh, yet the better uh, the fact that uh, grotto was venerated or the cave was venerated as the birthplace of the savior is attested from the very early point on origin in the third century AD already writes in Bethlehem the cave is pointed out where he meaning Christ was born and the manger in the cave where he was wrapped in swaddling cloth and the rumor in those places and among foreigners of the faith that indeed Jesus was born in this cave who is worshipped and reverenced by the Christians. So uh, there is a little bit more to the story. Uh, it may escape the eye, but if you look at the right, you're going to see what looks like a Roman temple, and indeed it is a Roman temple. And there are very humble archaeological remains, pretty much indiscernible to uh, any layman, to any visitor who is not uh, trained in archaeology. Uh, uh, Trajan, the emperor in the beginning of the second century AD, in 135 uh, AD, give or take, it's during his uh, uh, voyage through the Roman Empire and through the Middle East, 
and Bethlehem curiously enough builds the temple. Historical interpretation of such, especially given by uh, Saint Jerome, uh, a, a very prolific Western writer and theologian, but who is accepted as the holy figure in the Church of the East as well, uh, writes that uh, Hadrian builds the temple uh, as in order to defile the holy place for Christians. And there, here, allusion may be drawn that the very same thing was done uh, over the tomb of Christ. And those of you who attended our last presentation, you probably remember that uh, the Golgotha was part of the quarry, abandoned quarry, and tomb was located nearby. And Hadrian, when he rebuilds Jerusalem that was laid in waste in 70 AD, he builds a huge temple dedicated to Diana on top of the Golgotha and that uh, uh, covers the Golgotha itself and the place of the tomb, he thought to uh, truly uh, defile the Christian holy place, but in fact, he immortalized it uh, to the future generations. Um, so probably something like that have been done here as well, although some historians hypothesize that actually it may have been Christians who have adopted that gave the birthplace of the savior because the temple was dedicated to um, Adonis, the immortal lover of Aphrodite. And Christ comes to correct all sin, all injustice, and to clean all uncleanness. It may be two, it may be one or the other. Again, it's completely uh, irrelevant, actually, for the sake of our argument because the Christian temple built on top of the uh, pagan temple is actually, as again, the very same Jerome would describe it, is the uh, flag of victory. Uh, the truth prevails over darkness. The true birth overwhelms the lust. The justity and piety is proclaimed where the service of demon of demons was rendered. So it's very interesting that very early tradition talks about that very cave into which pagans have their services. So one way or the other, again, it may not be as essential, but what's essential as to how early Christian mind puts an aspiration over the false belief and truth that shines onto most unexpected and anticipated place. And in fact, we have a number of holy places in the Holy Land that follow the same very pattern, the same very pattern where archeological remains of previously served pagan cult was there, but it was not an adoption of the site. It was not a uh, supersession of the site. It was not continuation. It was utter transformation from darkness to light and from fal falsehood to the truth. Um, that temple is no allusion to Bethlehem. It, we have no idea how the temple by Hadrian and Bethlehem may have looked like, and indeed why he would build it all of a sudden Bethlehem, unless he indeed wanted to defile the Christian place of uh, worship. This is a reconstruction of temple in uh, Caesarea, uh, 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 Philippi, Banias, in the very north of what's today Israel. So with legalization of Christianity at the beginning of the first century, the mother of Emperor Constantine, uh, Helen the Pious, Empress Helen, comes to the Holy Land with an idea to uh, find and to immortalize, if you wish, by the places of worship, by magnificent structures, of the places associated with the earthly life of the Savior. So Basilica, and you could see the reconstruction of it, uh, was built sometime um, between 330 and 333. So it's not even 20 years later after the Edict of Milan. It's already mentioned as 333, even before its consecration dedication. But we already know from the historical sources, as May 31, 339, and through pilgrim accounts, we know that uh, that basilica have existed. Uh, a very big uh, 
round structure uh, top of the place of the birth has been built. And you could see where would the altar of the basilica would be. And the typical Roman basilica, public place, but also place of worship of Christians have been constructed with the courtyard and artex. So that's a, a typical Roman architecture. And that basilica stood for about uh, 200 years. Uh, you again could see the reconstruction, hypothetical reconstruction of the basilica as to how it may have looked like with octagon signifying the most holy place, which also fits well into the Roman narrative because with those dome chapels, the most significant places were marked. And many, if not many, but a number of places related to the earthly life of our Savior were marked by those domed or rounded or octagonal structures. Um, but as it was destroyed during the Samaritan revolts, and actually Samaritans exist until the present day, we hear about the Samaritans in the gospel here and there, and those are not strange features. It was uh, were quite populous uh, all the way till the time of Justinian. Some say there were about one million of them in the Holy Land, but during the rebellion, uh, there were two rebellions in the 6th century, 529 and uh, five. 56, if memory doesn't fail me, um, the basilica in Bethlehem is being heavily damaged. But Emperor Justinian, the great builder and very pious Roman emperor, who is actually canonized among the uh, saints of the Orthodox Church, he allocates money to build the basilica. So what remains from uh, the original basilica of Empress Helena, uh, the mosaic floors and some parts of the walls. And you could see here, in recent years, there were a mighty restoration done in the basilica, and they uh, have cleaned those floors that were actually open for public view, but were underneath and covered by the subsequent uh, floors that were done in restoration. But what's very interesting is that the current basilica, as you could see here, a plan and very nice pictures that I found taken, you know, as, as if from above. Um, actually exist from the 6th century. We don't have too many uh, churches surviving from the 6th century, from the time of Emperor Justinian. Uh, uh, some churches in Ravenna, some churches in Rome, of course, fragments of churches in Greece, um, but in the Holy Land, only one. Um, and it's pretty much the way, at least general layout, how it looked in the 6th century AD. And you could see here the entryway, and over here, it's another section in Grotto, you know, the, the, the cave of the nativity and above it, raised platform uh, with the church of the Orthodox with the iconostas and the altar. And that's a view from above. And we're going to enter into this basilica in just one second, but this is the only building that survived from ancient Palestine and which is absolutely incredible because in all of the centuries, uh, there were multiple invasions, and the most devastating was in 614, where Persians came and destroyed every holy site in the Holy Land, every holy site in the Holy Land. In fact, perhaps they did more damage than subsequent invasions by Muslim armies. And the story, uh, a very probable tale, but of course, there is no historical source for it. Over here, uh, you see uh, where my, uh, if you follow the arrow, that's a wall of the Armenian monastery. So it's a later construction from medieval period. This is the front of the Basilica of the Nativity. It doesn't look much like a front of any church, but we're going to talk about it. Here's the entrance. And it is believed that there was a depiction of Magi from the East, very much like this mosaic from Ravenna on the front of the building. And it says that Khosrov II, who led the Persian armies, and to Bethlehem was so touched by that picture that he allowed the structure and holy Christian site to stand. We don't know if it's true or not, but at least that's how the tale goes. And it sort of uh, fits the logic because no any other site uh, is survived the Persian menace and was, was any church where you'd go, what are the ancient Byzantine remains, you know, inescapably going to see the remains of the people who were killed in the most brutally. Um, uh, men, women, children, in, infants, 
young and old and whatever in excavations we could find those holy sites and they've been found even until the present day um, the pictures of devastations is the same everywhere and some of the sites have been revived but uh, the, the revival of those sites were short-lived because already in 20 years the armies of islam is going are going to come so the complete restoration would be impossible the muslims did allow some restoration of the holy sites it's going to be only during the crusaders where some of the sites are going to be revived but it's never ever going to be on the scale of the byzantine palestine where every village had a particular uh, that had a particular biblical connotation was adored was a marvelous basilic or monastery and those basilicas uh, were absolutely splendid uh, and the decor uh, was mosaics, colored glass, stained glass, um, gilded crosses, silver chalices, silver lamps, and etc. When you're approaching the entrance to the basilica, you entry through the very small doorway, and it say, uh, "This is the door of humbleness. You need to humble yourself in order to enter the place where the Christ was." Uh, born and it's a very beautiful story and i certainly not going to object to it but of course uh, history is very different uh, you could see here the beautiful cornice and i brought this picture to your attention this is from rome that the entry went to basilica from the fourth century so it's a rough contemporary of the structure or maybe exact contemporary of the structure and uh, the entryway into the basilica was at some point in history covered by stone and during the crusader period you can see this little arch on the photograph on the left that the entry into the basilica of nativity during the crusader period and that little doorway was actually installed so the people who trade inside the basilica are not going to enter it on horses somebody say well because arabs or turks or muslims were entering church on horses the truth uh, could be that but it may be even simpler for the long time interior of the basilica was used as a marketplace only a small fragment of this basilica was utilized still as a church but in uh, centuries closer to us the main nave was used as a marketplace and people of course for convenience sake would bring the animals donkeys or maybe camels maybe horses with carriages into the church so you needed to have a very small entrance to prevent it from perpetual for perpetual uh, desecration and by bringing animals in that's how it looks inside um, just before the restoration during the restoration mosaics here on the wall are bright up i'm going to talk about it in a minute but that's where you enter in and this openings in the floor through them you could pick and look at the mosaics from the uh, time when empress helena built uh, that basilica so the basilica from justinian period uh, has a little bit over um, higher floor but that's more or less the structure at least how it was in the 16th century again very rare building and for holy land pretty much unprecedented here uh we see how the church looked at the beginning of the 20th century. You, you see extra wall here that separates the part of the basilica that is being as a church. And you can see here the iconostas. And during the time of British mandate in 1919, uh, uh, Brits demanded that wall to be taken down so the uh, faithful could come and see the iconostas and that wall is not going to create that a very strange feeling of you know separation or what have you and by that time of course there was no more market uh, inside the church you see that may sound a little bit shocking but that's true human story we get used to everything even to the holiest of places during recent restoration an ancient uh, baptistry uh, was restored as well you could see here octagonal baptistry and if you look on top has some cracks it's uh, made out of a beautiful this pinkish um called hebron stone in the form of cruciform so it's good enough for the baptism of the adults but over here where no adults were baptized anymore at least not on scale we see a, a, a capital of the column perhaps from time of the uh basilic of saint helena maybe from justinian converted into the infant font 
uh, you see the capital of the building, right? You see the cross that would be on top of the column, you know, supporting the architraves, actually surviving inside the basilica from the sixth century. What's very interesting, the tree of life, tree of life growing out of a font. Uh, this imagery is not related to the baptismal font. Uh, that imagery is related to the Christian belief as to, you know, what Christ is and the baptismal frontal simultaneously is a communion chalice and the tree is eternal and it's, you know, hints at our anticipation and awaiting of life eternal. But this uh, capital was taken, inside of it was hollowed and then it was placed inside of this massive uh, baptistry for the baptism of the, of the adults. And here, pure, very curious, uh, children were baptized, you know, up until uh, relatively recent times. There's a close-up of the Greek uh, iconostas, while liturgy being celebrated on a daily basis on the main altar of the church, right above the cave uh, of the nativity. And uh, the basilica of the nativity, it also has a particular status quo. It's divided between Orthodox and Armenians. Although Catholics are allowed to celebrate liturgies as well, but there is no particular place for them inside the Basilica of the Nativity. And they built adjacent church dedicated to St. Catherine's to the left of the main basilica. But nevertheless, there is a particular thing, a status quo, where a particular set of uh, time slots reserved for each denomination to have a uh, celebration of the liturgy. And of course, Armenians celebrate the liturgy in the Armenian altar, Greeks on the Greek altar. Um, Catholics in the Church of St. Catherine, but when they descend into the cave of the Nativity, they all celebrate liturgies and they turn on one and the same altar. And there's also a uh, very interesting feature. This is the stairs and descent to the cave of Nativity, uh, probably uh, expanded during the uh, Crusader period, uh, maybe it didn't survive you know, uh, well enough, but still this is the pieces of marble that's surviving until the present day. Church was all covered in marble, um, but it was stripped by the Sultan of Egypt in the 18th century. And then 19th century uh, saw the removal of the floor, saw the floor and stairs that you see right now were covered in the heyday by marble and entire floor was covered by marble and perhaps mosaics as well. And that's typical arrangement for pilgrim church where you coming uh, from the north and ascent to the, uh, to the south, usually, you know, uh, this basilica doesn't point to, toward Jerusalem, toward the east in particular. That's an opening uh, underneath the ground. So you descend uh, by the stairs and there is a fairly large opening uh, may be good enough to accommodate up to 50 people. And here you see an additional opening with the mosaic of nativity right about it. And that's where believed Christ was born. That's where Mary laid and there's a silver star point out to the place where uh, Christ was born. And people coming, they bowing and they kissing the star or they touching it with forehead and their lamps are lit. So it's a actually very moving experience. And um, right next to uh, the place where Christ was born, the place is demonstrated as the manger as to where Christ was laid in swaddling cloth. So as you descend down the stairs here in the middle of the picture, uh, to the right of you, there is going to be the uh, altar above the place of birth. And to the left of you is manger. Uh, curiously enough, in Byzantine times, there was a lot of holy things that were demonstrated. You know, historicity or provenance of them may remain unknown, but something has survived even until the Crusader period. And the wood of the manger is being demonstrated to faithful pilgrim in uh, Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. So you can see the liturgy is being, being celebrated by a Greek or Arab priest, so the star that we uh, talked about right there in semi darkness and the shadow, All right? And then when faithful come, they uh, bow, they need, you need to prostrate yourself in order to venerate the place by a touch or by a kiss. 
and uh, it's open for tourists as well, but of course, mainly it's pilgrims who come. And every morning there is liturgies, uh, uh, Latin, then Greek, then Armenian. And this uh, the places, you know, the place of the birth, the manger, close up manger. And this is the view of the cave in its entirety, as if you're looking from that star and to the back. So there is just this marble uh, floor, marble flooring. And again, place probably able to accommodate 50 people, maybe even more. I mean, when there are liturgies and everybody wants to get in, um, it's shoulder to shoulder. You cannot even make sign of the cross and it's pretty stuffy and hot, but everyone is really excited about being in such a very special and unique place. Uh, Basilica bears some decoration that were cleaned up in recent years, uh, but these are from much later period. Unfortunately, not much decoration, if there were much decoration surviving from the time of Justinian, definitely nothing from Emperor's Helena time. But this we see a uh, phenomenal collaboration between the uh, uh, Latin kings of Jerusalem, uh, Crusaders, and the Byzantines. And that job was done in the um, 12th century AD during the height of the Kingdom of Jerusalem before its fall to the Muslims. Um, the mosaics were very dark and covered in soot in recent years prior to 10, 2010 and 2010 to 2020. For 10 years, Basilica was very extensively renovated, um, not rebuilt, but restored. And it was the most extensive renovation probably ever since the time of Emperor Justinian. Not to say there were no restorations in between, but definitely not on such scale. And you can see the most marvelous uh, mosaics, the tesseras, uh, uh, gold leaf squeezed between two uh, plates of glass and colored stone for uh, depiction and outlining of the figures. Uh, something absolutely incredible. And um, uh, Byzantines, of course, had an upper hand, uh, even that Latins have commissioned these mosaics. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, a testimony to this joint effort survives on the walls of the basilica. There is an inscription. Inscription was done on one wall in Latin and the other one in Greek, but only one survives. Um, dates back to 1169 and says the present work, meaning mosaics, was finished by the hand of Ephraim, the monk, painter, and mosaic mosaicist. In the reign of great emperor Emmanuel Porphyrogenetus Comnenus, and in the time of the great king of Jerusalem, Lord Amori, and of the most holy bishop of holy Bethlehem, the, Ro the Lord Raul, Latin bishop, in the year 6677, second indiction. 66, it's from the creation of the world. So it translates 1169 uh, AD. But what audacity by the hand of Ephraim the monk before the names of the kings. Usually the painters would be mentioned next to the kings. Uh, only the names of the commissioners would be mentioned, but probably Byzantines who were so, they wanted to send the, the message. And uh, Ephraim, who was out of sight of the emperor's communists, put his name even ahead of the name of the emperors, which is absolutely historically unprecedented. There is another inscription done in Aramaic, it's meaning that local population was involved, not only artisans from Constantinople, but it is the uh, highest, highest uh, achievement of the Byzantine art. Uh, some monuments like that surviving, but definitely nothing like that in the Holy Land. And um, uh, whatever is surviving, and, only percentage of original mosaics are surviving. Uh, a very interesting theological program on both walls of the basilica. There are depiction of the councils with inscription that uh, dealt with the humanity and divinity of Christ and uh, mosaics of uh, ancestors of Christ according to the flesh with Latin inscription. So we can see Greek on the walls. Uh, when we deal with the ecumenical councils and the name of the saints, uh, the holy ancestry according to the flesh of our Lord depicted underneath it. Overall, there are uh, surviving 42 figures, uh, perhaps a little bit less 42, the were 42, but no, there are less figures surviving. But again, incredible artistry, and you see them from a distance and just absolutely of phenomenal phenomenal beauty and the brightness and diversity of colors are just absolutely, absolutely um, incredible. Okay, 
So what else there is to see next to the Basilica in Bethlehem? Uh, Cave of Innocence is shown, and I brought to, you, to your attention this picture of 19th century uh, French painter. I'm thinking it's very telling. It's not part of the Byzantine iconography, but it's certainly uh, absolutely amazing imagery that uh, captures the horror of the mothers whose child is going to be taken away and killed. Um, here's more Byzantine iconography, and there is the cave with the skulls and bones of the holy innocents. I probably switch back not to dwell too much on the human remains. Um, we don't hear much uh, about the uh, massacre of innocents outside the gospel. If we're talking about Hero the Great, although his son was not much better, uh, here at so-called great. Uh, uh, he was certainly a very villainous man. Uh, somebody suggested that massacre of children alludes to him killing his own three children, his own three sons, and multiple other assassinations. Bethlehem, some people argue, may have been a very small place, and not more than a handful of infants were could be found there and in surrounding area so in relation to other horrors it's a relatively uh, uh, small act big for us and christians and big threat to the newly born king of kings but on a historical scale a geographical scale perhaps not even worth of mentioning be as it may be as it may the, the very important thing the very important thing is that uh matthew uh, alludes to the prophecy from the book of Jeremiah. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. The voice is heard in Rama weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because there are no more. Rachel is the mother of the Jewish nation. Rama is a place where Rama actually is the high place and high place where um, Assyrians or Babylonians were replanting Jews into the territory of their empire upon the conquest of Israel or or Judah were uh, selecting sort of a incarceration camps, um, concentration camps where people would be brought in order to be transported collectively into the land where they're going to be uh, placed. Uh, but Rama also a, a geographical location uh, where it is believed that uh, Rachel is buried, whereas there is a tomb of Rachel. And until the present day, there is a Jewish outpost. There were soldiers guarding that holy place and a tiny uh, prayer hall for the Jews, a tiny synagogue. So even in the book of Jeremiah, the story goes on and continues on much more uplifting note. Nevertheless, for Christians, that was fulfillment as Rachel weeping for her children. You know, the substitutory king who really didn't want to abdicate his power, an usurper, um, not an anointed one, but rather substitute for anointed one, who is not Christ is an antichrist. He pretends to be the king, although he is not, he shouldn't be the king, he should step down and he paves his way with blood. But another very interesting note that we have to say that Christ in the early Christian understanding was linked to Moses. Christ is new Moses. Just as Moses lead Egyptians from, uh, uh, excuse me, lead Jews out of Egyptian captivity, parting of the Red Sea is symbol of parting of death. Jewish nation is a nation of newborn uh, servants of God, uh, you know, Christians, uh, a pharaoh, a devil. That this imagery was deeply ingrained in Christian understanding. So the creation of image of new Moses, the new lawgiver, you know, thinking about the um, preaching of Christ on the Mount of Beatitudes and new commandment I'll give to you, a new lawgiver, right? The new, the new Moses and whom the fulfillment of this Moses is foreshadowing Moses' prophet, not because he prophesies something, but because he in himself is an imagery of the true Messiah who's yet to come you know, uh, alludes to what? To the uh, death of the firstborn of the house of Israel during their Egyptian captivity. In the Hebrew literature, was which Matthew as a Jew and perhaps for a sake of Jew and well-endowed man, as we know that he was a tax collector, was very well familiar, 
was the legend that angel of the Lord woke up the parents of Moses. It's extra biblical account, of course, and tell them to hide Moses before, before he's found by Egyptian soldiers and killed. So we see very parallel that historically and literally is lost in us, but actually theologically served for the embellishment of who Christ truly was. Christ is new Moses figure. So we see a lot of image rebuilt into the nativity scene. And uh, I don't want to be misunderstood, but when we're talking about the nativity story, we're really talking about the triumph of God's promise versus the real sequence of the events. Again, a massacre from the Menelope. Who are the bones? Bones of innocent first, um, some, most, most of them without a trace. These are uh, the remains these are the remains of perhaps Christians who were assassinated by the Persians during the invasion of 614. And uh, Christians always wanted to be buried close to the holy sites. So as land around uh, those hills are very porous, there are many caves. And there was the, the multiple Christian burials. So we could see that these are general Christian burials and perhaps burials of the martyrs as well, but they are demonstrated as the remains of uh, holy uh, innocence. Uh, one very important person is linked also to the city of Bethlehem and to the Basilica of Bethlehem, and that is Saint Jerome, about whom I already mentioned. Saint Jerome was born in Roman Pannonia, um, not sure where it is now, but somewhere in the territory of former Yugoslavia, either Bosnia, Herzegovina, or Slovenia, or Croatia, somewhere in that area. He went to Rome where already as an adult he was baptized. And as a, uh, he had the Pope for his patron, he traveled to the Middle East where he practiced rigorous asceticism, came back to Rome and uh, found a favor among some wealthy Roman matronas above all uh, a lady widowed named Paula, who was from the senatorial family, but widowed, uh, mid-age widow, so she would accompany Jerome for quite a while, who enabled uh, his study of the scriptures to continue. And he replants himself in 382 to Bethlehem, settles into the monastery that Paula endows with money, one monastery for males and another for females. And he lives there for uh, about 25 years. Uh, first, he starts with a, trans, uh, with a correction of the tr translation of the uh, Latin uh, Bible under the patronage of Paula and her daughter Eustochius. And he, of course, directs us to how to uh, build the monasteries and companies for to travels and mentors her into ascetical living. And she sponsors his uh, studies. And he was the one who translated uh, uh, the Hebrew Bible into Latin. Prior to that, translations were done from the earlier Greek translation that we know as the uh, translation of the 70 or Septuagint. But he takes it upon himself to translate from Hebrew. And as a result, early Latin translation is divided as later uh, Protestant Bible, which includes canonical and so-called so apocryphal books, which with Orthodox take all as a part of the canon of the Holy uh, Scripture. But toward the end of his life, uh, Jerome came to accept the authority of all the books as he quotes the books that he considered to be a, a, an apocrypha alongside with the rest of the uh, New Testament. Not much is visible in those caves. It's a set, sets of rooms. Some of them turned into chapels. Some were very apparently grave sites, but that's where St. Jerome believed to, to live. And that's where the early Christian monastery existed. And we have to remember that um, East and West was much, much closer. All those people understand themselves as Romans, of course, despite of their language. And there were many, many, many people who are coming there from all over. We have 
in fact, earliest pilgrim accounts are those who came from the West, like Egeria, from Spain, all across from Mediterranean, pilgrim of Bordeaux, the territory of modern day France, pilgrim of Piacenza in Northern Italy. Those are the earliest pilgrim accounts. We're talking fourth, fifth, sixth century. So they were coming from what we consider to be Latin West, but there was no division in Latin Western and Byzantine or Greek East. It was one church and monks Easterners and Westerners lived, and Armenians and Georgians for that matter, and Syrians and, and uh, Egyptians, they all lived uh, absolutely side by side, uh, working together uh, to the glory of God. Um, this is the mosaic of Paul and Estochius and St. Jerome was companions who are working with the translation of the Latin Bible. And here's the oldest uh, version of the Latin Bible in existence. It uh, comes from Northern England, from the monastery where probably you've heard it was Sambid at Jero uh, uh, Wearmouth. Um, for the longest time it was on continent, but recently it was returned back. It's a, a parchment book, you know, made on skins and uh, 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 Latin script, but it's a translation, translation first uh, Latin Bible. It's, it's not the oldest, but it's the oldest surviving Bible uh, that we can trace back. And as Westerners, of course, we're indebted to that tradition uh, very much. And that should not be oversighted because it's also a very important work of God. Now, this imagery is Romanesque sculpture from France, from Autun. Angel wakes up uh, me, uh, wise man to follow the star and to go to adore the uh, Christ child. But in the text, they were told also by an angel not to use the same road because Herod was looking to kill the children. So remember from the gospel according to St. Matthew, says they took the, uh, a different road. And here I'm showing you to, to you the monastery of St. Theodosius the Kenoviarch. And as I said, people wanted to be intricately linked to the land and land was sanctified by various holy events that were transpiring in every corner of it. And here we see uh, yet another cave that I assume you came to love by now very much. And yet one more cave located on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And that's a cave believed to be a home for three wise men on their way around Jerusalem. There were several different roads as to come from the east to uh, to Bethlehem, naturally, uh, Bethlehem and Jerusalem much closer nowadays because city grew in size dramatically. But even back then in the day, they were not too far apart. Uh, you know, half day walk at the most. Definitely in days walk, you, you would be able to cover it. But they took another road more directly east toward the Dead Sea, toward the land of Moab, where the King Highway is on the mountains of Moab in order to depart to the easternmost land and uh, uh, St. Theodosius came and established his monastery there. He was contemporary of St. Sabas. So we're talking about the fifth uh, century. Uh, he built a communal living for the monks. The uh, monasteries that you see here, it was built, of course, it's modern monastery built in the 1960s as original monastery of St. Theodosius was destroyed during the Persian invasion, but uh, underground, a cave and this two little domes on the forefront of the picture on the left are indication of where that cave is. Um, uh, that's the place where the Magi were overnighting or staying for a period of time. And during the Byzantine time, it was turned into a communal cemetery where a number of very famous Orthodox saints are buried. Uh, for the longest time, there were relics of St. Theodosius himself, of his parents, of uh, parents of St. Saba, the, the sanctified, the father of all monasticism in Palestine. And uh, also here you see priest or ecclesiastic standing next to the tomb of St. John Moscos, uh, the author of the Liminarium, or this book of spiritual meadow that collects various anecdotes, stories, and miracles. Uh, that were transpiring with various holy men and women in Palestine and uh, Middle East uh, on the eve of the uh, Persian invasion. So here's the chronicle uh, of, of the glory of 
ecclesiastical Byzantium in the Holy Land. And he basically leaves and the Persian army uh, uh, follows his footsteps and destruction, ravaging of the Holy Land. So if you'd like to uh, read something about it, of course, it's greatly embellished eyewitness account and you see and you probably understand even more what I mean, that histories were written very differently. It's not to say that they're not history and what's written that did not take in place, but the whole concept of history, the whole concept of, of uh, relating the tale pursue a totally different uh, purpose. It was not about relating of the facts, but relating of the meaning of those facts. You know, people try to discern something for themselves and they're writing what they believe is of most importance to them and to their readers as well. So this is one of such uh, marvelous ancient books. But nevertheless, it's also in the vicinity of Bethlehem, yet one more holy place. And the last holy place that we're going to talk today about also, it's halfway between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, the so-called Church of Cathedral. Thisma or uh, uh, Church of the of the Great Seat, or Church Church of Seat. Uh, very interesting story related to it, according to the legend related to the Virgin Theotokos, was she was pregnant with Christ, and Joseph take her for that uh, census Bethlehem. Uh, she gets tired and she sits on the rock to rest. Um, gets off the donkey or the camel. And then they would continue on after her resting. And uh, that place was venerated uh, by Christians as the holy site from the very early place on. But what's very interesting that shortly after the first council of Ephesus that uh, proclaim virgin mother to be the Theotokos or the birth giver of God in 431 AD, uh, bishop or patriarch of Jerusalem, Juvenalius, he uh, was participant of this Council of Ephesus in Asia Minor, and he uh, sponsors or directs to build a marvelous octagonal church with most splendid mosaics on the place where believed that the Virgin Mother have sat. And very quickly, it becomes one of the foremost pilgrim destinations in the Holy Land, because, of course, the narration of the Mother of God was ever present with Christians. But here we could see something absolutely incredible, where uh, the cult, Marian cult, begins to ascend, and pilgrims on their way on the journey to Jerusalem stop in this basilica, uh, octagonal, better say, church than basilica, uh, that is nicknamed Cathisma and venerate, venerate the mother of God. Curiously enough that we have echo uh, of the practice that originated in this church. It's the blessing of the candles for the feast of the presentation in the temple. Uh, suggestion is made that uh, the practice of blessing of the candles and in Cyril of Alexandria, contemporary to the building of the church talks about how the uh, the the light of the day should be consecrated or blessed with the lighting of uh, the lamps or candles during the time, so procession. That was related to the feast of presentation of Christ in the temple. And, uh, you know, perhaps various processions were done. Let me I'll show you another picture. You, curiously enough, could still see something very similar to the church and how it looked like, like in heyday. Over here, you see the plan of the Cathisma Church and the rock. Look to the right. Does it look familiar? Maybe to some of you, it will look familiar. To some of you, it will not. That's a mosque uh, and the Dome of the Rock. And it's inside the Dome of the Rock. No tourists, no pilgrims, unless you're Muslim, could enter in. But also, there is a stone in the middle from which supposedly Muhammad ascended to heaven. But you could see the imitation of what was already existing in the Byzantine Palestine. And the uh, mosque itself was built by the uh, uh, Byzantine craftsmen. It certainly has a uh, beautiful Arabic script. It has tiles. It doesn't have much figural mosaics. But on the inside, you could see very much the same Byzantine ornaments that you can see in ancient Byzantine churches. So by looking at this structure, we sort of could guess 
as to how the uh, Church of Cathisma dedicated to the celebration of the Virgin Mother and to the celebration of proclamation of the Council of Ephesus and Palestine and the holy place where she was from and where Christ's child was born uh, have looked like and how marvelously it had to be uh, generations ago. So uh, my very last picture for today's presentation is flight to Egypt. Of course, after Magi have departed and just before the massacre of the innocents, Joseph in the dream is told to take his family that included not only the Virgin Mother and infant or maybe toddler by that time, Jesus, but also his son from the first marriage, James, the, be called, the, called the brother of the Lord, and flee to Egypt. Why I'm finishing my presentation with this uh, slide, with this uh, image. I started my today's presentation by saying that Christ is entrusted to us for unto us the Son is given. That's the most essential story. And if you're going to take anything from my today's presentation, I want you to take this into your heart. The flight to Egypt is to fly into relative safety, but it still takes a great degree of trust to go into the unknown land where you're equipped with some things, but you're really a stranger. And out of Egypt, as scripture would say, I would call my sons so he could, I would add, shine. So the Egypt, in many ways, figurative Egypt, is truly our heart. Christ is given to us as an infant with great degree of trust so he could gush forth through our love, through our effort, through our celebration, through our joy, through our witness of the kingdom of God as Christ truly coming unto his preaching upon return from Egypt. Yes, we by skipping is growing in Nazareth and maturing to the age of 30, but again, being in, concurren in concurrence with the preachers of old, I want you to use that as an inspiration, that story of mighty God, the creator of the universe, who comes to us as, as a child to be entrusted into us so we could be glorified in him and he could be glorified in us. For now, the story of nativity is about him fleeing into Egypt, fleeing into our hearts where he supposedly could be saved, but he's given to us so our witness could shine, so his name could be glorified. And so we, like after Apostle Paul could say that it's not us who live, but Christ in us. So we could become everything to everyone. So at least some through our service, through our dedication, through, through the glory of his name could be saved. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Father Ilya. Um, we can clap for you. Oh, I don't know. Can you hear me? You can. And all clap. <laughs> um, thank you very much for, for leading us on that way. Um, we did have um, we did have one question in chat, and then I'll open up the microphones if people have others. Um, we had one question when you were talking about the, the monasteries and how they were built over yes. the only places you were showing that slide. Someone asked the question if those monasteries that you were talking about were one and the same with the place where Christ was born, or were they different sites? No, uh, uh, we uh, talked about uh, four different holy sites uh, today, basically. We talked about uh, uh, the monastery of St. Paul and Eustochius and St. Jerome that is adjacent to the Basilica of the Nativity. In fact, there was no formal monasteries at the time. There were, but they were not, let's put it this way. And certainly there was a monastery associated with Basilica of Nativity that would take care of the pilgrims coming there. But the monasteries that I showed to you, one is in the shepherd's field, which is about something like three, four miles away from the Basilica of the Nativity. You know, shepherd's field, quite naturally, you know, it had to be on the outskirts of the story. And then I talk about the monastery of St. Theodosius, which is about another three or four miles further into the desert. 
I didn't show you the picture, but actually Bethlehem is already in the desert. On one side, there are uh, green hills. Well, green, not in the scorching heat of the summer or early fall, but uh, more green during the time like now, during the late fall and you know spring and, and, and winter where there's a lot of rain and everything turns green, even desert turns green. But further south you go, or further east you go, it become completely barren desert. Think about lunar landscape. If you'll come there in March, it may look somewhat uh, green, but if you'll go there in May, or God forbid in August or September, it would look more deadly than uh, you know the dark side of the moon, literally. And then you understand why uh, Jews believe that it was you know, place where demons inhabit because it's deathful silence and slithering of snakes and crawling of the scorpions is the only thing that you could hear. And it's very an inhabited place. So those places are far removed. The last site that I showed you, the Cathisma Basilica or Cathisma Octagonal Church, there was some community associated with this as well, but it was not as a pronounced uh, monastery. It was more a uh, location of the holy sites, major pilgrim destination, where pilgrims would come perhaps in a procession from Jerusalem on the way to Bethlehem. Depends on what the, what the route was, because there were very particular pilgrim routes and they varied one from the other. Uh, I'm not going to talk to you about how holy places seem varied from each other, you know. I hope I didn't shock anybody by some nuances that I mentioned to you today, but it's not because of the lack of faith, but because people understood faith very differently. You know, they would come to a particular place to venerate it as the place, and then, you know, there is a collapse in administration, and that villages by the holy site become uninhabitable, so they establish another place by the road. And when they ask why you establish it here, so, well, because it's dangerous, they were not going to do it. We're not stupid. So we're going to venerate the place here because after all, the grace of God is where we are and where we're commemorating the particular event. To us, today is shocking. You know, when you're going to buy a new cell phone, you want to know, is it iPhone or Samsung or, or sort of a cell phone, you know? Uh, you know, you, you want to know with precision how, how much data there is and how much memory there is and how much this and that. They obviously were not uh, obsessed about things like that. They were much more rigorous in, in, in some things, but much more freer and, uh, and, uh, and free-minded in, in, in regards to other things. So it was the narrative that needed to be kept. And even uh, precise location have been lost to, in, in history. It was not lost in spirit. So we're talking about completely different mindset. So coming back to the question is, uh, is the monastery, yes, there was a monastery right next to the basilica in those caves, and perhaps something built on the ground that did not survive until the present day. Uh, however, those two monasteries that I showed you, they're a distance removed. They're in very long walking distance, or if you're there, you go by air conditioning bus, you know, um, a couple of minutes and you're there. Everything is very close. Everything is in close proximity. I uh, lifted the the disabled mute option. So if any of you have any questions that you'd like to ask Father Ilya, you can go ahead and unmute and uh, ask your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, please, somebody raise the hand. <laughs> I've got a question, Father. Um, yes. The icon of Jer Saint Jerome. Uh, what is what is the reason for the lion that is next to him in the icon? Was he martyred? But was he killed by a lion? No, he he's not a martyr. He is so so called venerable father, right? Okay. Uh, we don't have doctors in the church. No, it uh, relates to his uh, life story. Where according to according to it, when he was in Syrian wilderness. A lion came to him seeking help oh, okay. because it has splinter in his paw and he took the paw out, uh, the, out of the splinter out of his paw and uh, the lion was uh, tamed uh, as, 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 as some kind of peaceful animals and there were lions in Palestine at the time. Lions were all over the place actually in, 
uh, you know, today Turkey and what's today Balkans and they were all killed off over the period of time. So there were lions in the Middle East, definitely during the time. So when you hear a story about Mary of Egypt and an encounter with the lioness and Gerasimus of Jordan and the lion, there were lions there. You know, um, they probably were more like lions from Ethiopia, not with big mave, but um, as they were lions. So, but that's that's the story. That's the story. He also very often depicted, very often depicted with the skull um, as a reflection of you know uh, fleeting life and reflection of immortality. So this would be, but that would be m more of a, a Renaissance type. Uh, imagery, not very typical in the Orthodox icon. So in fact, it's very sad that we have several Western saints that are not very well known, and the 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 not their sanctity as much, but the tradition of the veneration called them question, like Saint Augustine, for instance, uh, Saint Ambrose, maybe to less extent, Saint Cyprian of Carthage, um, Saint Jerome, um, and some others, uh, Saint Benedict. You know, I was once in Italy with a group at the monastery of St. Benedict and the priest was very nervous to sing a glorification to St. Benedict because he said, well, he's here really an Orthodox saint. Well, he lived 600 years, if not more, before the separation of the churches uh, and what to consider to be separation of the churches. So um, I'm very much uh, for us reclaiming the antiquity regardless where it comes from and not to be nationalistic, not in the sense of being Greek, Serb, Russian, Ukrainian, or Bulgarian, or Serb, or Georgian, but in a sense of really universality, not being just focused on the uh, what would become known to us as Byzantine East, because there were many marvelous things happening all over the place, uh, with equal rigor and equal sanctity. There was, there was uh, so I don't know if I answered to your question or not. You did. Thank you very much. Thank you. There was a, a, a transcript with links to specific places, icons, and architecture. Uh, uh, I'm available via Facebook, and um, this uh, recording is going to be available on YouTube. Uh, I believe, and Father is going to send links to whomever is would desire so. So, if you have any particular questions, you could uh, look at the recording of this uh, presentation again and ask me questions. I uh, I'm not hiding, so I have nothing to confess. Uh -huh. Many of the imagery I just took from the open internet sources, right? So we're doing the charitable thing when it's not a commercial proposition. Uh, many of the places, curiously enough, especially during the trips, when you're taking a picture, you know, there is half a head of Uncle uh, Uncle Tom, and then a lower jar of Un uh, Aunt Ruth. And then you don't remember what the guide name was, but he takes most of the picture and you can't, can't, can't remember where you were and what you're taking picture of. So I do as far as pictures of those sites as I've been there many, many times. So, but I'd be most happy uh, to tell you what it is. And um, during my presentations, I'm trying to bring in uh, a variety of imagery from ancient uh, Christian uh, mosaics, from Romanesque manuscripts, from uh, Byzantine icons, from some modern art, you know, 19th century art, just to diversify things because we could not be stuck in one static image. And of course, to keep you from falling asleep, hopefully. Uh, maybe some people did anyway. Well, um, a lot of people are commenting, Father Ely, as you can see, about anxious to be on tour in Jerusalem and Bethlehem someday. Um, someday. I, you know, uh, I, I will say to all of you here that, you know, that might be the goal of the next step with this, with the FOCA, is that at some point in time, uh, we would sponsor a trip that Father Ilya might actually take us there uh, and be able to stand in those holy places and be there. But talking to Father Ilya, not, not, not this time, but uh, a few months ago, uh, the indication is with the virus that that's not going to be potentially possible, at least not for the Holy Land. I don't think in this next year, is it, Father Ilya? Israel, Israel is one of the most uh, restrictive countries as far as uh, epidemiological situation. Um, in fact, borders right now are closed again. There was 
a little hint that restrictions may be lifted. And I even planned a trip for next May tentatively, to be honest, without much anticipation that it's going to go to fruition, but the borders got closed again after five weeks of being open. And there are many, many, many restrictions that make the trip nearly impossible. There are a number of countries that you could travel to. Um, uh, uh, basically, the issue, common denominator is vaccination. But those who are vaccinated remains unharassed. And you need to pass one antigen test before departure back to the States. And if, God forbid, you shown positive, you need to quarantine in the hotel. It's an extra expense, but there is insurance for it, so to say. So it's an inconvenience, but it's something manageable. And statistically, even as the information assessment comes about this new variant, if you boosted, you probably should be OK. And, 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 and probably, but again, I'm not selling somebody on a death trip, right? <laughs> with Israel, with Israel, it was different. You needed to pass a PCR test upon arrival. And what if you freakishly positive? Then what? That was my concern that I'll bring a group of people and then somebody shown positive. And then you can't depart back home. You can't continue on the trip. And you have to quarantine the government facility. So what kind of fun is that? No any other country, no any other country requires that. Um, um, I'm offering, not in a way of, again, sales speech, but I'm offering several trips next year, unless the borders are going to be closed, we're planning to go. Uh, Egypt, Asia Minor, Jordan, uh, Italy, um, those are wonderful places and impossible to cover in one presentation, but I'll be most happy to do if you so desire about the whole of places that remain obscure to us, but nevertheless are absolutely phenomenal. So if anybody would uh, be daredevil enough <laughs> to join, you're most welcome to do so. And there are some people, some faces whom I see who have traveled with me and, you know, holy places are not only traditional Orthodox destinations, you know, Russia and Israel, well, for some Ukraine, maybe venture to Georgia, but to go somewhere else, God forbid. No, it's, it's, not, it's not like that. They're all incredibly overwhelming. Um, and some of them are less restrictive and possible for visit. And if you're a smart traveler, you probably should be all right uh, in your travels, so. so. Well, you know, if you want more information on traveling with Father Ilya, it's orthodoxtours.com, right? Right, right uh, yes. So yes. You can check out the website. Very simple. Anybody else have yes. a question for Father Ilya? But if you have a question about the presentation, because I'm here not to advertise for my trips, which right. of course I love to do, but I'm not invited here to do that. So I'm not going to abuse you. I am here to, I'm here to answer to any of the questions. Is there an absolute restriction with no vaccine? Um, in, in Israel, yes. If you're not vaccinated, unless you have some medical reason, but then probably still won't be let in. In other countries, no, but um, in order to access any public places, you need a negative test. And negative test now is good only for 24 hours. Are you going to do the test every day or not? That's the answer. So um, not only it's a huge expense, but uh, okay, if it's an open archeological facility, probably nobody's going to ask you to, but if you're going to a museum or you're going to the church, or going to a restaurant, you're going to the hotel, not 100% of the time, because people understand that you need to have a break. But um, I did lead a group to Macedonia, North Macedonia, excuse me, in September. And upon entering to the restaurant, uh, or before entering the restaurant, like whether we had vaccination certificates or negative test, and we said yes, and I tried to pull something out of my wallet, and no need, just make sure that you have it, because if you don't have it, and if police is going to check, it's 3,000 euro fine. So that answers the question right there. So it's not my personal belief. It's not... My personal suggestions, I'm not taking sides. You know, people have different reasons for different types of actions. And I respect that. However, um, the answer in general is probably not. Uh, otherwise, it'd be 
logistically impossible. It would be too much hassle. Um, but uh, for those who are vaccinated, uh, issues only with your personal level of comfort. Uh, other than that, you can buy a ticket and depart somewhere tomorrow. And in fact, most of the world, in fact. Father Ilya, any other questions about today's presentation for Father Ilya? Well, we're, we, we're, we, all can't so we all can't clap and have, have you see us at once, so we'll all wave, Father Ilya. How about that? That's, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, you very much. Christian. Thank you. It, 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 it's my great honor and pleasure to be here with you. Thank you very much for your time. I certainly hope that you learn something and maybe celebration of nativity is going to be uh, slightly more enhanced. Um, again, the recording of this conversation is going to be available. And if you have any questions, either in presentation or in any other matter, please, by all means, I'll be most happy to provide you with the list of links, resources, articles, what have you. And if you'd like to stay in touch, I'm a frequent visitor to Facebook. If you have a Facebook account, send me a friend request and okay. we'll be in touch. Sure. So no that, uh, pressure. No so, you know, so you know where to find Father Ilya. Um, he, he is, uh, his YouTube channel is just Ilya Gotlinski, right, Father? Yes. And, yes. and you, so and, you can, you'll be able to find the video of this presentation there, uh, you know, maybe after Christmas to give us some time. It will also be on the new FOCA um, YouTube channel, the Fellowship of Orthodox Christians in America. You can find it there. Um, if you're interested and didn't get to be with us on our trip to the Holy Sepulcher, uh, and the tomb of Christ that he did in in uh, in April of this past this year. Um, that's also available on his YouTube channel, and I just uploaded it uh, a day or so ago to to the FOCA channel, so it's there also. And um, I will uh, take the opportunity to get one last shameless plug in for an FOCA yes. event. Uh, uh, you can you can talk, Father Yuli. I won't. I won't I'm. I'm uh, on the December 26th at 7 p.m., if you haven't seen it yet, um, the, o the FOCA is sponsoring um, a virtual Christmas concert. Um, we have to date probably about 20 choirs that will participate in that, in that, uh, in that event on about at 7 p.m. Eastern on the 26th. So if you want to gather with your families and sing some carols or hear some hymns, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, we have par we have parishes from Pennsylvania, from Texas, from Massachusetts. So um, you're welcome to join us there. I'm going to say thank you to Father Ilya, and then he, I think he has something I, left. To I say just to wanted finish. to yes, I just wanted I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, with the ascent of COVID, I started to do presentations, educational presentations, absolutely free of charge and available to everyone. And idea was to do them in English then there was a russian public and now i do them almost exclusively in russian and not in english why because english participation desperately lacks and i didn't know how to get message across i invite uh, 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 famous bloggers uh, uh, scholars archaeologists artists to do uh, you know absolutely f fantastic presentations if you go on youtube and search under my name Ilya katlinski you see that about 100 uh, programs already posted again majority of them in in russian but it's not because of my personal preference i served in uh, you know an english speaking parish and would gladly do more of them in english but when you invite some scholar who attracts 2000 people for his presentation there are three people there it leaves a little bit you know poor taste i'm not saying that i don't value those who come but people especially as they're coming absolutely free of charge and volunteering at the time would like to see some participation. So if you'd like those programmings and I'm going to continue with them and they were for a year and a half on a regular basis, I said we had over hundred programs today. Um, we could continue quite easily. Some of the presentations were done by me, others by guest speakers and they have great number of people lined up. So uh, if you'd like to please spread the word and send your requests in what topics you'd like to cover and whom you'd like to see. And I'll be most happy to arrange it. And it's again free and educational and pursues no any other uh, goal but fostering of Christian knowledge of history, theology, biblical studies, art, architecture. It's like a mosaic of everything. 
um, some of it may be very niche subjects, but nevertheless very interesting. So please, you could, you know, most welcome to look at those lectures, look at the backlog of those lectures, and then uh, let me know how you'd like me to continue because I do it for for your edification yeah. and education. So thank you very much. Thank you, Father Ilya. God bless you. A, a joyous uh, end of the Advent season and a blessed nativity to all of you. Uh, and an early Christ is born. Glorify him. Glorify him. Have a great evening, everyone. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father Ilya will talk. Father Ilya will talk. Okay.